You were just listening to the testimony of Madison Nygaard, a teenager who says Jeffrey Willis abducted her. She tried to use his cell phone. When she got into his silver van, he told her the phone did not work, pulled a gun on her. In the face of this gun, she opened the door, leaped out of the moving car, and was able to escape to a close home and call the police. And now she is testifying in the trial of Jessica Haringa. This is a 25-year-old mother in Michigan who went missing. Jeffrey Willis is accused of killing her, but her body was never found. Um, he is going to stand trial, Julie Rendleman, for this alleged abduction. Right. Why is it coming in now? Tell me the legal basis of why this would be relevant to prove that he killed a woman whose body has never been found. Well, you know, I was, I don't know what the specific arguments the prosecutor gave as to why this specific witness comes in, but I can say that in general, when you have a case, um, the law allows you to bring in other evidence, even evidence of bad acts or bad crimes, if it's in some way moves the ball in terms of the actual case that you're trying. And so in this case, separate and apart from the fact that she was abducted, which we believe is what happened to the victim in our case, um, separate and, uh, and apart from the fact that she got away, um, is that we have evidence that the gun that was used um, to um, on this surviving victim mm -hmm. um, was the gun that was a recovered from his um, vehicle mm -hmm. and we know that that same gun is a, a piece of that gun was found at the scene of the gas station and so I hate to use all those different pieces but if we put those pieces together she links Jeffrey Willis to the gun, which is linked to the disappearance at the gas station. And, and so also, that's one of the issues that allows it in. Two, yeah. we have the silver van, which is a similar vehicle to the one that we believe is used in this case. So when we start to put those pieces together, a, a judge can say, well, that's, that's relevant, and that's something the jury has a right to know um, in order to make a decision about the guilt or innocence of this defendant. What about the fact that she quite literally helped solve those other two cases, if you believe that Jeffrey Willis is linked to Jessica Haringa's disappearance? Because it wasn't until, you know, Jessica Haringa went missing in 2013. Sure. A year later, Rebecca Bletch was found dead. So it wasn't until 2016 that this abduction happened. And that's when police were able to locate the vehicle, apprehend Jeffrey Willis, search it, find all of these materials that they were able to link to the and get a conviction in the Rebecca Bletch case and bring these charges in the Jessica Haringa case. So does that make her super relevant? It, it doesn't. Um, and, and, you know, the, the fact that they searched the vehicle and recovered those various items Items is relevant. The fact that she's the one that at the end of the day led them to being able to prove that he was involved in both those other murders mm -hmm. is not. I mean, but one, from an investigative standpoint, isn't it important to establish to the jurors how police found this guy? Well, what led them to him? I, I think there, that is an argument for the prosecutor to say, listen, we want to give them the narrative. If we only give them a piece of this, then the jury's going to be like, wait, why'd you search his car? Why was he even a, a suspect? All those things. So you're right in terms of that. And again, I hate to go back to what we talked about earlier about the whole idea of prejudicial versus probative. But then the judge has to make a decision. Well, okay, this is a narrative. This is something perhaps the jury should hear. Should they hear it? Is it probative enough to let it in? And I think in this case it is based on the fact that, you know, obviously it's pr prejudicial because... Um, he hasn't been convicted. Because, right, and, and we know that he tried to abduct and potentially kill her. But by the way, what evidence that the prosecutor admits isn't prejudiced. The whole reason a prosecutor wants to get evidence in is because it's going to be helpful to them. Helpful to them means prejudicial to the defendant. Simply being prejudicial doesn't prevent it from coming in. Um, the issue is whether or not it's relevant and probative. And I think in this case, it is. This is a very nuanced question, but if you're sitting on the jury and you hear that the judge is going to allow this stuff in, on the basis, by the way, that this was potentially a prior bad act that helps establish a pattern or a scheme, is the juror going to hear that, and are they then going to think, well, if the judge thinks that there's a pattern and a scheme here, isn't that prejudicial in the sense that already he thinks this guy's a serial killer? It's a great question, and I don't have the simple answer. The judge can, can give a curative instruction to the jury. He can say to the jury, listen, the only reason you're bringing in the evidence of this prior bad act is to establish certain pieces of evidence, i.e., if you accept that the gun is the same gun that can link 
um, one victim to the other victim, if you accept that the cars are vehicles, something like that. He can also go further and say this is being admiss admitted to show kind of a, a common scheme or plan. But it's you, the jury, who has to decide if that common scheme or plan exists. It's not my decision. It's not anyone's decision other than yours, and you're the one who, at the end of the day who have to decide if that common scheme or plan really exists. But even if you're a highly intelligent juror and you do not hear the basis for the judge's reasoning, you may think this is sort of an unspoken admission by the judge that the fact that he thinks this is all relevant, he thinks it's all connected. I, I, I think that's a great point. I, I think that's a great point. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and that's why there's a potential appeal issue. There's always an appeal issue, but that's what an appeal process is for, is did the jury, you know, not only did the jury do it because because the they believe that the judge thought uh, that it should come in, but did the jury not care at all about kind of the facts and evidence about this specific murder and just find him guilty because of all the other pieces of evidence that came in? Absolutely. Now let's go to our producer here at the Long Crime Network, Anthony Velez, for our top headlines. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We're going to take a quick break now, but we will be back with live trial coverage out of Michigan. The trial of Jeffrey Willis, who is accused of abducting and killing Jessica Haringa, a 25-year-old mother whose body has never been found. This is a murder trial without a body. We'll be back right after this. And welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Welcome to our Sirius XM listeners. Back in 2013, Jessica Haringa, a 25-year-old mother, went missing from her gas station attendant job. There were drops of blood found outside of the gas station that belonged to Haringa. A co-worker of hers passed by the gas station and saw a silver van drive away. Later, three years later, Jeffrey Willis was apprehended after a teenager accused him of trying to kidnap her and identified him, and he was then connected by police to the Jessica Haringa disappearance, as well as the murder of Rebecca Blanche, which he was convicted of, and that happened in 2014. Let's go live to our trial coverage, where we are now hearing from a DNA expert whose name is David Hayhurst. So now we are seeing a purple battery-operated, looks like a vibrator, a sex toy, and he is talking about how he tested that, you would think that would contain some DNA, but how long does it actually last? How long is it preserved? Because we're talking about him, the police finding these items three years after Jessica Haringa went missing. I think, I mean, he'll talk further about it. I'm sure he'll do it on crossing as well, but in terms of, you know, degradation of, you know, of samples, although they can last a very long time. It looks like, you know, look, as a crime scene, you know, as the, I'm sorry, DNA expert, what he's basically doing is taking out each item, explaining what it is, explaining where, if any place, they attempted to get DNA and mm -hmm. whether or not they were successful in getting DNA. Um, actually, there's something that was just taken out, and to be honest, and maybe I'm naive, I can't figure out what it is. Um, I know we had the ball gag. I know we had the vibe, what appeared to be a vibrator, a purple vibrator. I don't know what this item is. It's, it's some sort of t sex toy. Um, that we, I am not familiar with, so. And he's pulling them out of a toolbox. I guess, Julie, you're not familiar. You haven't used anything like that ever, so you're not familiar with it. But uh, let's talk about the contamination of these types of, of tools or toys. He could have, number one, cleaned them, right? But Absolutely. also, you have a murder victim. that He was convicted of the murder of Rebecca Blake a year after Jessica Haringa went missing, right? So he could have used these on other victims and then they would be contaminated. Right, but then there'd be DNA from those other victims. You right, know. but wouldn't it mix together, and how would they get a clear sample out of that? Absolutely, and I don't, I, you know, look, I haven't heard the whole results yet. It looks like he's pulling something. <laughs> well, let's, let's listen and let's see what he's pulling out. And just to identify this for our Sirius XM listeners, we are now looking at the gun that was recovered from Jeffrey Willis's van, the gun that prosecutors say connected him to the disappearance of Jessica Haringa and her alleged murder, the murder of Rebecca Blache, and the abduction of this kidnapping victim that he's being accused of as well. Let's listen in. The DNA expert has just whipped out handcuffs from this toolbox, handcuffs that are attached to a chain to tie somebody somewhere, so not just bound them by the hands, but also to fasten them either to the silver van or somewhere else where the defendant may have taken these victims if, in fact, he used these toys. But again, they were found in his van. Let's listen in. So what we're seeing now from this DNA expert are a pair of leather restraints 
that are fastened together by a silver rod in the middle and have locks on each restraint. These look like handcuffs. Obviously, they're made of leather. And this is some sort of a sadomasochistic sex toy tool that was found in Jeffrey Willis's van. We've also seen a vibrator, a pair of gloves, an, an anal hook, and a variety of other sex toys that he allegedly used on his victims, if you believe the prosecution's theory. The DNA expert is talking about testing all of these items. Let's go back and listen in. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. You're just listening to a DNA expert as he took these sex toys out of a toolbox that was recovered from Jeffrey Willis's van, and we saw a whole bunch of disturbing things. There was an anal sex hook, there was a vibrator, there were handcuffs, there were leather restraints. So this is clearly sadomasochistic behavior in the bedroom. Um, we're gonna we're gonna toss to a quick break. We'll be back to talk about it right after this. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network and to our Sirius XM listeners. We are covering a trial out of Michigan. Jeffrey Willis accused of the abduction and killing of Jessica Haringa, who went missing in 2013. She was a mother whose body has never been found. But Jeffrey Willis's van was found. It was searched. And inside, some disturbing sex toys and tools that prosecutors believe were used to abduct, rape, torture and kill Jessica Haringa, as well as another young lady, Rebecca Blach, who whose murder, by the way, Jeffrey Willis was convicted of in a previous trial. Let's go back and listen to the findings of the DNA expert who tested a variety of sex tools that he has just shown to the courtroom, including a vibrator, an anal sex hook, a pair of leather restraints, and a variety of other things that he that prosecutors believe were connected to Jessica Haringa's disappearance. And what you're listening to is the testimony of a DNA expert who just talked about how he tested some panties that were recovered from Jeffrey Willis's van. But he also brought out a variety of bondage and disciplined sadomasochistic sex toys that he has gone through his analysis of these sex toys. He tested them, including an anal hook, a vibrator, a leather restraint. So we're talking about bondage and discipline, dominance, submission, sadism, masochism. Why is this relevant, Julie Rendleman, to this trial? The fact that these tools were found, how can they connect this to Jessica Haringa's disappearance? Well, again, I, 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 and we haven't heard how, whether it links or not. We haven't heard any of the, the specifics as to whether or not there's any DNA found on it that's linked to her. Though we but, know that he has not found human but, blood on a variety of these objects. But they did also, right, but, but merely have it, you know, there's also DNA that comes from things other than blood. So we haven't, you know, we're Sexu we're Sexual at, DNA from semen and the like, right, vaginal right, right. excretions, which is what we would see if he was using these tools on his victims. Right. And again, as you said before, he can, I don't know specifically where the DNA is, if there is any, but he, if there isn't any, then obviously an argument can be made that he wiped them clean after using them. Remember also what was shown was the gun. Uh, that we've talked about several times that was pointed at uh, the surviving victim and that we know at least a part of it was recovered from the gas station. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's going to talk more, but he did say that he did find some seminal fluid in the panties. Let's listen in. So, Julie Rentelman, we heard some of the findings of this DNA expert that he was not able to extract blood from a variety of sex toys, including an anal hook, a vibrator. I mean, there are some deviant things here. You have leather restraints. Does this just show that maybe he has some sick fetishes, or do you think that if they do find the DNA, obviously that would be damning, but that's critical here. Yeah, I, I, obviously whether there's DNA there is, is very critical, but I think merely the jury hearing about these items being in his vehicle is extremely, extremely, um, it go, it's going to influence them extreme, extremely, especially when we talk about the surviving victim. Yeah, and even... What they think that she could have faced had she... Um, been there. Even without a direct connection. Well, thank you to the SiriusXM listeners. Join us tomorrow for more. And for now, we're going to take a quick break, but Law and Crime Network uh, viewers, tune in after this.